God, our maker, you guide us as the sheep of your fold. When we stray into rebellion and unbelief, bring us back and restore us, that we may follow your ways and listen to the voice of our shepherd who gives us eternal life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Acts, chapter 10. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him up on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and of the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I love to jog, but I have a hard time calling myself a runner. I love to lace up my shoes on a beautiful day. I love the sound of my foot hitting the ground and rhythms that make the stress of the day fade away. I love the feeling of accomplishment when I crest a hill or finish a long run. But most of all, I love how much I can eat the rest of the day. <laughs> or at least I tell myself I can eat anything I see. But I'm not a runner, really. The truth is that I'm really, really slow. I plod along. Experienced runners run past me and make me feel like a car stranded on the side of the road as an 18-wheeler zooms by. But I love to do it. I love testing the limits of my endurance, both physical and mental. I love seeing new parts of my neighborhood or seeing parts of my neighborhood I drive through all the time. But when I run, I notice so much more. The trees, the house, the houses, the way the road rises and falls, usually more rising than falling. But I'm not fast, I'm pretty slow, and I'm okay with that. Speed isn't always of the essence. When it comes to jogging, keeping, pe keeping a particular pace is not my aim. When it comes to jogging, just finishing the race is my goal. In our text this morning, I can relate to Peter. Peter's a slow jogger like me. Our story in Acts tells a story of a God who whizzes past us at incredible speeds and a church who lags behind God's great speed. Acts here narrates how God can sometimes move so far ahead of us that we don't even notice God. It tells us about a God who is at the finish line before we have even started lacing up our shoes. 
It tells us about a God who makes wide promises to the world, but also about a church that is slow to understand how wide and how radical God's promises are. We hear in the story about Peter's encounter with a righteous centurion named Cornelius. Now, earlier on, Peter was taking a nap when a heavenly vision strikes him. In the vision, Peter sees a sheet coming down from heaven with all kinds of animals. Uh, Rusty Brace in one of my classes called this uh, the meat blanket, and it's really stuck. I can't, I can never not, I can never think about it any differently than that. If you know Rusty, it makes sense. A voice from heaven instructs him and says, kill and eat. And Peter resists, noting that he never has and never will eat unclean foods. But the voice from heaven insists, telling Peter not to call unclean what God has made clean. The voice has to repeat this message three times, and yet Peter remains unconvinced. The Bible notices that he is puzzled by what he has seen. Soon after this, some of Cornelius' servants arrive. While Peter was having his vision, Cornelius was having one of his own. In his vision, Cornelius is instructed to send for Peter. Cornelius immediately obeys the vision and sends for him. Cornelius, we learn, is a centurion. That that is, he was a leader of the military force that kept the so-called Roman peace. Rome keeps peace not by assuaging people's worries, but by showing them a sword. They don't gain people's affections by caring for their needs, but with the imminent threat of the greatest soldiers the world had ever known to that point. He represents the distant power that had oppressed the whole people, threatened their lives and their faith. And as we know, Rome would eventually destroy the temple of God and raid the city of Jerusalem. Cornelius should be a villain in this story. But we also learn that Cornelius was a devout person. He prays, he gives to the poor, he cares for his neighbors. In short, he is a person living in tension. On the one hand, he's a Gentile, a representative of Rome's cruel power. On the other hand, he is a person of exemplary faith. What does God make of such a person? What does God make of any of us in our own divided allegiances? What does God make of a person who cares for her neighbors and is yet part of part of or even leads structures of sin and oppression. When Peter arrives at Cornelius' house, he speaks in an oddly contradictory way. On the one hand, he notes that it is unlawful for him, Peter, to associate with these Gentiles. But on the other hand, he seems to recognize something really important about his vision. Though the sheet from heaven was full of animals, Peter was not being instructed about food. The vision was not about the things we eat. It was about people. The vision is not about refusing to call certain animals unclean. The vision is about refusing to call certain people unclean. Refusing to say that certain people are outside our webs of belonging. Refusing to say that certain people are outside of God's love. But Peter's still hesitant. This is a radical change in his understanding of the world. His world is disrupted at its core. So in the midst of all this uncertainty, he begins to preach, and to preach, and then to preach some more. Sometimes it's easier for us to talk about what God might do instead of living into God's new world. And what Peter says is right. God shows no partiality. God embraces anyone who seeks to follow God's way. And though Peter is saying the right things... I'm not sure he's ready to walk the walk. In the middle of Peter's sermon, God says, enough. Look at verse 44. It starts while Peter was still speaking. While Peter is still speaking, God's Spirit arrives. While uh, while Peter is still speaking, the Holy Spirit dawns upon Cornelius and his whole household. It is as if God is saying, enough, Peter, I have made myself clear. I have shown you all you need to know. I know this is hard, but this is where I'm leading you and the whole church. When the Holy Spirit dawns upon these Gentiles, those who were with Peter were surprised. I imagine Peter was surprised too. They were astounded that God's Spirit had even reached, you know, those people. They were astounded that God's arms are wider than they had imagined. And why were they surprised? 
After all, the promise of the gospel will reach the Gentiles is made in the songs that accompany Jesus' birth in the first chapters of the Gospel of Luke. In the earliest chapters of Acts, Jesus himself commands the disciples to go to every corner of the world. Indeed, the prophets themselves had imagined every nation coming to worship the God of Israel. Why then were they surprised? Perhaps they were surprised because there was a gap between their hopes and their imagination. There was a gap between the world as they knew it and the world God was calling them to. They were surprised because habit and experience had taught them the world would never change. They were surprised because they were honest. They were comfortable with a world divided between those of us whom God loves and those whom God and we alike despise. God had moved far ahead of Peter. God had moved far ahead of the church. Promises made in the days of the prophets and then repeated at Jesus' birth and in the earliest days of the church gathered around his name were now coming to fruition. And those who were with Peter had to be convinced. Those who were there had to be converted. This is not the story about a conversion of a Roman centurion. This is a story about a church that had to change. A church that had to see the world in a new way. A church that had to hear God's promises with hope and trust, not fear and apprehension. A church that had to give up previous lines of division. I can relate to Peter on my long jogs. More importantly, I can relate to Peter when it comes to the way God leads us. Can you relate to Peter? Have you experienced a church unwilling to imagine how God is changing it? Have you experienced your own unwillingness to follow God's tug into a new place, a new relationship? Have you experienced that fearful moment when God has moved ahead of you and you're not sure you want to follow because it would mean giving up everything you think you know? Is there a Cornelius in your life of faith, a person through whom God will change you in ways you would never expect? Are you ready to welcome that stranger into your life? Are you ready to be amazed at what God is doing? The last time I ran a half marathon, I tried to run a little too fast. About mile 10, the pain in my knee began. About mile 11, it became pretty uncomfortable. And about mile 12, I was wincing with every step. In the last mile, I walked slowly and painfully. And I haven't quite gotten myself up to those kind of distances quite yet. I worry that the injury might return, that I will feel it step after painful step. When God shifts our understanding, it will be painful for us. When God shifts the boundaries we have drawn, it will puzzle us. When God turns the world upside down, it will throw us for a loop. But on the other side of that finish line, on the other side of all that confusion and pain, God's kingdom is waiting for you. And that kingdom will probably look nothing like we expected. So be ready to be surprised. Because God has done it before. In place of our gospel canticle today, we'll be singing hymn 643. We'll sing it three times in English, Spanish, and then in English again.
Let us pray. O oh God, you are unexpected, puzzling, astounding. You are beyond our understanding, and you work and wait far beyond the limits and barriers that we put in place. You have called your servants to ventures of which we cannot see the ending, by paths as yet untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, 